So 2023 was an incredibly successful year for me. I released four different videos that hit over a million views within a few months with a fifth and possibly even sixth on the way. I got a ton of new subscribers. I made some videos that I'm extremely proud of, videos that I had been hoping to do as soon as I got on the platform. So they were like long standing dreams. And I think I fully established myself as one of the top people doing the type of content that I do. However, in the middle of this wave of success, I thought about quitting several times. It wasn't due to the constant drama and needling from various people who have beef with me. It wasn't due to running out of ideas or anything more typical. I was thinking about quitting because I wasn't sure if I was okay with the unintended consequences of my success. The fact is, if you're black and successful, that means you're probably finding that your peers and the people around you are starting to look less and less like you. And suddenly you're managing how you're perceived and how said perception might affect your future opportunities. But also you're in negotiation with how you continue to try to relate to the black spaces that you still reside in and how those spaces might perceive you as you constantly go in and out of that space to travail through white spaces. You might wonder, are you being rewarded for your talent and hard work or tokenize for your ability to go along and get along and not rock the boat too much. Is your success the fruit of your labor or the benefits for allowing yourself to be exploited? And most significantly, what are your priorities in that equation? Are you actually still making efforts to represent and speak for the community you came from? Or are you willing to do anything in order to keep your spot? That conflict is at the heart of what defines the idea and concept of being a sellout or Sambo or Uncle Tom or and it's also a core theme to the 2000 film Bamboozled. Bamboozled is a 2000 film by Spike Lee that feels like it was made in 2025 because its subject matter and themes have never stopped being relevant. This film is prescient in so many ways because in an era of Tubi or Zeus Network or the American League of Magical Negroes, gotta hope that movie doesn't turn out to be as awful as its preview suggests. On top of this, we also still live in a social media age where coonery and buffoonery is still very valuable and still very lucrative. So it makes sense to use this film Film as a guy to unpack what it really means to be a and you know get back to some good old media analysis so this is the black media breakdown We have to start by talking about Spike Lee, who I've somehow managed not to really get into a lot this entire time making videos. He is the most acclaimed and prolific black director of all time, as well as probably the most interesting and complex, having went through multiple phases of being a superstar director and a pariah and now something in between. He's at it again. Spike Lee is once again exploring the dynamics of race relations. Lee thrives on the topic that Hollywood once thought was taboo. I think we should be more demanding of the audience, you know. I think most films today are made for two-year-olds. Spike Lee started out as a Hollywood darling, getting his start at Morehouse College and then film school at NYU. As is often the case with talented black people, white institutions eventually came and extracted him out of where he originated at. He was offered resources well beyond what he could have done making independent films in the New York scene or wherever he was, you know, cutting his teeth at. Our generation that went to film school, we didn't care about the degrees. All we wanted was the equipment. Mm. You know, we want was equipment. Right, the access to the equipment. That's all we, we didn't care about the degree. We just wanted access to the equipment. And when that does happen to a talented black person, the deal usually is, hey, we're here to make your dreams come true and it'll be a seamless and haggle-free experience. It's seldom mentioned the totality of that wager and what you're going to have to go through to reach those dreams up front. This is the crossroads for many black luminaries. Either you go forth into the white world at their own peril or be satisfied with the adulation and acclaim of a smaller, predominantly black space, minus the chances at greater fame and greater resources to make art. Spike Lee's first film, She's Gotta Have It, put him on the map. His second film, School Days, put on display that he could do even better with a bigger budget. He looked like he was going to be the next big thing in Hollywood, but these were first and foremost black movies and mostly concerned themselves with issues and things that were easily understood by black audiences only. So with his third film, he took a swing at something more universal, but also incredibly challenging with Do the Right Thing. You know, deep down inside, I think you wish you were black. Get the fuck out of here. Laugh if you want to. You know, your hair is kinkier than mine. 
What does that mean? And you know what they say about dark Italians? You know, I've been listening and reading. You've been reading now? This is possibly still his most acclaimed film to date. It was on tons of best lists the year it came out. Siskel and Ebert named it their best movie of the year, if I'm not mistaken. Do the Right Thing does not have good guys and bad guys. And in fact, one of the film's biggest surprises comes when one of the characters that we really like commits a violent act. What Spike Lee is doing here is throwing out all of the cliches and all of the nice, soft, soothing reassurances that we like to give ourselves about life in America and showing step by step how everyday events can lead up to a racial incident, an incident that grows out of a long history of racism in America. And it has been on many a greatest film of all time list. But in that year, it wasn't even nominated for a Best Picture Award. Seems to me that in order to be nominated as one of the five best pictures of the year, a movie should at least have a touch of greatness somewhere in it. The other four nominees do. Dead Poet Society does not. And of course, when you think that this movie was nominated instead of Do the Right Thing, it shows you at least some Academy voters who are living in the past. This would be the first time Spike faced the reality of his position. He may be a white audience's favorite Negro, but he always be in a disempowered position. He would be incentivized to not rock the boat and be grateful for his spot, and he would be punished if he did the opposite. Do the Right Thing with its ambiguous ending elicited protests and complaints that it was anti-white and recalls race riots. And even decades later, it's clear he's still kind of angry about this snub. I know it was a long time ago, and you should let some grudges go. But David Denby, and Joe Klein wrote articles the New York Magazine saying, hope to God that this film does not open in your neighborhood. That this film, Do the Right Thing, would incite black people to tear shit up, to take to the streets like Detroit, in 77 or Newark in 1968. We're on the right side of history, her street. Thank you very much. And more importantly, from then on, Spike constantly found it difficult to get funding for his films, even as he kept regularly making money for studios. I've been doing Kickstarter before there was Kickstarter. That's how I raised the money for my first one. She's gonna have it. So why go to Kickstarter then? If because you know how to raise because, money, why because, are you going there? Because crowdfunding is the new wave they get financing, crowdfunding, okay. where you go directly to your base, directly to the people who love, she's gonna have it, school days, do the right thing, Malcolm X, uh, he got game, Summer Sam, 20th Hour, Inside Man, Kings of Comedy, Kobe doing work. Mm -hmm. That's a body of work that's been amassed over three decades. Though it can't be denied that he definitely did have some unforced errors of his own, it didn't make sense to him why it was so hard for him to get a project off the ground. Some years later, Spike Lee would make Malcolm X, a movie he had to fight for the right to direct. But after that, Lee clearly fell out of favor in the studio system. By the time he gets to Bamboozled, he's 15 years in the game and at what seems like his lowest point. And he's over being treated like some major risk or oddity in Hollywood. Are, are people uh, already going crazy? crazy about this movie? Are you, are you getting a lot of, uh, is there a lot of controversy about this? Well, number one, I'm really tired of that word controversy. I think that it's so easy today, Dave, that the, the label people, and I think it's just an act of laziness where you don't want to spend the time to say who these people are, describe something, just put one word to it. Mm -hmm. And for me, Spike Lee film, controversy yeah. right away. Yeah. I think that's this film is a very thought-provoking film. He's also extremely frustrated with the way black people are being depicted in the media and the types of black shows and movies that are being green lit while his movies that are showing a more productive and positive image of blackness can't get any funding. Jamie Foxx said this about mm -hmm. you. Have you seen this quote? Yeah, I've seen it. With the most respect I can give him, I think he needs to back off a little. Mm -hmm. I think it's getting to the point where nobody cares because he talks about it so much that now he's just become the angry guy. The mm -hmm. angry black mm -hmm. man. I read that quote. For me, the anger I talk about is not the anger that let's burn down the United States, let's other us overthrow the government. I think anger could be constructive. And if I see a show like The Secret Diary of Desmond Pfeiffer, which was a show about a whole a sitcom about a Holocaust, mm -hmm. you know, my ancestors were slaves. I don't think there is anything funny about slavery. 
So if I voice that opinion, is Spike he's angry? Is Spike the angry that a show like this is allowed to be on television? But yes. it's Spike wanted to make movies about Joe Lewis and Jackie Robinson, but he couldn't get them made. So Bamboozled became his commentary on the entirety of the system and the experience that he was having being a talented black person, having to force himself into a specific box in order to get the accolades, recognition and support that he deserved. And again, despite being made over 20 years ago, it perfectly encapsulates all these conflicts just as clearly as it might have today. Bamboozled centers around one Pierre Delacroix, Delacroix, Delacroix. Delacroix. Wayans is also part of one of the most prominent black families in Hollywood, the Wayans, who have worked independently in Hollywood for decades now, though probably most famous at the time for the black comedy sketch show in Living Color. Wayans as Delacroix doesn't make any sense. His real name, first off, is not Pierre Delacroix, it's Peerless Dothan. What are you gonna do, Peerless? And Wayans gives him this ridiculous speaking voice and mannerisms that are explicitly not black coded. <laughs> Now, I have been doing a lot of soul searching, okay? And once again, you're right. My previous work has been all surface, superficial. Had I been informed of this very important staff meeting, I would have canceled my Pilates session this morning. I am so happy to see you, cats. What's up, dude? Hey, what's up? Something that De La Croix would have had to pick up through years as a tool to separate himself from other black folks. That's that's my impression, y'all. I hope I hope I hope it wasn't too distracting. You need to cool that shit out. De La Croix is Harvard educated and clearly very successful, so clearly something about this has worked for him. But he's also in a bit of a rut and in need of a win at his writer's job for a major TV network. I was never good at performing under the gun. Well. This wasn't a gun, it was a bazooka, and it was pressed point blank against my temple. So from Jump, this character already has some very clear anti-black tendencies, and the black audience is meant to distrust him based on how he presents himself. I don't want anything to do with anything black for at least a week. Black people watching will have been keen to understand that there's like code switching, right? Where you speak in a more appropriate and proper cadence and inflection in order not to scare the white people that you might be speaking to. This is how you talk to the police. And that's normal. Most black people know how to do that. What De La Croix is doing is trying to completely alienate himself from any type of black aesthetic that people would attach to him until he opens his mouth. Slavery has been over 400 years ago. We need to stop thinking that way. Stop crying over the white man this, the white man that. This is important because as Delacroix goes through the story, you'll be prone to think that he's changing, but in reality, he's just becoming more of who he always was. Along with Delacroix, we have Sloane, played by Jada Pinkett. She is his assistant, and her plight as a woman is almost the exact same plight as Pierre Delacroix, but the movie doesn't take a lot of time to dig through it, which is actually kind of spot on in how historically examining the challenges of racism toward black men has often required black women to take a back seat. Though this element does come up later and has a few pointed moments in the story, Spike just isn't immune to having his fair share of covert and overt 80s and 90s era misogyny, but at least he kind of acknowledges it. It's funny how a man always has to perceive an attractive young lady as having to fuck or suck somebody in order to get to the top. But as I said earlier, this movie is really about him and his experiences, so it centers around De La Croix. I'm gonna say that name differently every time I say it, y'all. I'm sorry. It's just how the word works. And so when we start the film, Sloan and Delacroix are under the gun because their TV station is floundering and they need ideas. To make all this worse, their immediate supervisor, Dunwitty, played by Michael Rappaport, is not interested in any type of black media that doesn't adhere to a specific marketable image of blackness. The material you've been writing for me, it's too white bread. It's, it's white people with black faces. The Huxtables, Cosby, a genius, revolutionary, Theo, Lisa Bonet, Dell. But we can't go down that road again. This character, which was supposed to be a criticism of like Quentin Tarantino, the edgy white guy who's watched a few hood movies and listened to some Tupac and assumes that they have a strong understanding of blackness and that makes them prone to be out of pocket. There isn't ever any second guessing yourself because slavery is still such a hot button issue. Yeah, I know it is, but I, uh, but I think that's a damn shame. Looking at my computer, I don't know if I would have ever heard it. All right, hey, download this. I don't know how to do that. All right, you know, it's a sign on the front of my house that said dead storage. 
Jimmy, you know I ain't seen no shit. Did you notice the sign in the front of my house? It said dead storage. Eh? It's very ironic that this character is played by Michael Rappaport, who eventually had a major falling out with Spike Lee because he's been in a few hood movies and listens to Tupac and assumes there is a strong understanding of blackness and so is prone to also being out of pocket. Things evolve, they get better. You know what I mean? And those neighborhoods in Brooklyn, the, ma the majority of the neighborhoods that have been gentrified were either abandoned. Williams Point, well, Williamsburg was, a, was a, a joke in the 90s. It was like this little niche place. It was like, you know, warehouses. It's good that it got better. <laughs> First of all, motherfucking Rapport doesn't know what he's fucking talking about. Here's the thing, gentrification, what Michael Rapport left out because he's stupid, he did not, he not talk about the people who can no longer afford to live in Williamsburg, who can no longer afford to live in Fort Greene, who can no longer afford to live in Clinton Hill. Yeah. Yeah, it's better for you. Somebody in my comment section joked that Michael Rappaport didn't have a script and he was just kind of riffing off the chain. So when you hear him with lines like this. I've known black people my whole life. I mean, if the truth be told, I probably know better than you. Put some new knowledge in your fucking dry ass dreads. Yo, my dude. <laughs> <laughs> dry your, you fucking nigga kind of makes sense. Dunwoody is very explicit about the fact that he wants something really black and really real. To which De La Croix and Sloan have the radical idea to offer something so offensive that it would likely get them fired, freeing them from their contracts with severance. Dunwoody wants a show, so that's what I intend to give him. The show will be so negative, so offensive and racist. Point being that him, the network, does not want to see Negroes on television unless they are buffoons. Delacroix and Sloan find Tommy Davidson as Womack and Savion Glover as Man Ray, two down on their luck street performers squatting in abandoned buildings trying to make ends meet. They are to be the stars of a new age minstrel show. They will be the front face of the Our show is satirical. Wait a minute, hey, we're gonna need a little more money for this. Come on. 10 little niggas? Okay, you get more money. Delacroix and Sloan leave the hard work up to the poor Negroes. I won't get too much into my leftist class analysis bag, but I can't skip it too much here. We have a bourgeois black person exploiting the poverty of the black poor as a way to ingratiate themselves with white bosses. There's no way for me to not notice that. Black excellence, y'all. They pitch the show to Dunwoody who loves it and then it's on. Well, Mac becomes Sleep and Eat and Man Ray becomes Mantan. What's the name? Sleep and Eat. <laughs> Sleep and motherfucking eat. Oh shit. Mantan, Sleep and Eat. Two real <laughs> Real, keeping now, it real. I know that this is out there, right? We follow the trials and tribulations of Mantan, Sleep and Eat. Two real <laughs> the dusty duo. And there they have it, Mantan's new millennial minstrel show. Let's go there a little bit, shall we? Minstrel shows were a type of vaudevillian variety show popular in America from the 1800s up until almost the 1960s, believe it or not. From way down south, where the commentators used to go, there's great big elegant pictures show, and my old Kentucky home is a French chateau. And it was an explicitly racist form of entertainment where white actors would put black makeup on their faces, paint their lips, and lampoon the behavior and actions of black slaves and black freedmen. These shows were incredibly popular and successful for decades and born from them plenty of participants who weren't white, but sometimes still in blackface. In fact, some black minstrel acts would laud their blackness as authentic, and seemingly these black minstrel shows are better reviewed than their white counterparts. While the minstrel show was an explicit form of variety theater, its popularity and influence made it into regular TV and dictated the work of many a black comedian and actor throughout the early 1900s. Even without the black face paint, the design to see black people behaving in a way that reinforced stereotypes and negative perceptions of black people was always popular. One of the first breakthrough black actors of the 1900s was a man named Lincoln Perry, better known as Steppen Fetched, who was billed as the laziest man alive. I was laying down dreaming, everybody was trying to wake me up. I ain't bothering nobody, just busy getting my own business, doing nothing. 
acting up. He parlayed this comedy act into one of the most successful film careers a black man had ever had at the time. This success brought him life-changing wealth, but what was the cost? That's the question that's gonna come up multiple times here. What is the cost of this type of activity on a black person's spirit? And further, what is the consequence for the community being harmed in the process? More on that later. To get back to the story, Sloan has a brother named Big Black Africa who's constantly dead named as Julius. Big Black Africa and his rap group, The Mau Mau's are interesting. I find myself reevaluating their presence in the film at the age and intellectual stage I am now. On the surface, they're another spoof of black radicalism and today would be pejoratively referred to as hotubs. We from here on, henceforth and whatnot, it's just spelled black, B-L-A-K. Not yeah. And this is not unique, despite what some white figures continue to want to say about black separatism and blitlers. The truth is that black radicalism has rarely been taken seriously by most black Americans since the 1970s, and somewhat for good reason, as many a would-be black radical or revolutionary has ended up being exposed as a quack or a scammer or abuser, sometimes all three. In response, black media has openly mocked the image of black radicalism for decades, with Damon Wayans ironically being being one of the most iconic people to do it. I've retracted my go dads with gigantic proportions. And the silent of the prohibition, you see, defecates the fluids of detention between the essence of the Euro intercourse, you see. So the Mau Mau's were clearly in that vein but also maybe not so much. What's often missed about the legacy of black radicalism and the lampooning of it is that black radicalism never died coming out of the 70s. It was just for many, many years greatly invisibilized, mostly the result of counterintelligence initiatives and the promotion of more moderate and conservative approaches to addressing black issues. I talk about this more in the second black conservatives video, but here in Bamboozled, as an adult who's now studied actual black radical politics, I see small elements and details that indicate Spike, who himself is a pretty radical figure in his own right, didn't want to completely shit on black radicalism. So even as Big Black Africa and his group seem silly, if you listen to what they're saying, there's actually some real shit there. Black, red, green, flag waving pseudo revolutionaries. First, you done messed up the colors first. What's the colors? It's damn, it's just red, black, and green. Everybody, white people know it's red, black, and green. So, and secondly, red, black, and green. Why, why are we pseudo? If we was talking about some ice and fucking Cristal and pushing Bentleys and fucking popping Mo and all that shit, then we would be the fly shit. And unlike other silly versions of this community, some of the markers that identify them as radicals are pretty legit. For example, they're named after the Mau Mau's. So this is a reference to the Mau Mau Rebellion that happened in Kenya in the 1950s. The Mau Mau's are legendary in that they were one of the most brutal resistance movements in the history of anti-colonial movements. While their violence and brutality might be looked down upon today, and they were inevitably defeated, Kenya still won its independence shortly after they were put down. Another thing is the Mau Mau song that they performed during the audition that's also on the soundtrack. They make reference to Franz Fanon, a founding figure of black leftist radical thought who also saw violence as an inevitable result of colonization and liberation movements. It be about the devastation of the social Darwinistic thought. Keep a brown man down sport. They want to keep by in the fetch and set. Wait, Franz Fanon put it? It lucky I ain't red wretched yet. And that's a name you really wouldn't hear too much as a layman watching this film outside of this film. I know I sure didn't notice it when I watched it when I was younger, but when I rewatched this film recently, I was like, whoa, wait a minute, I know that. That said, I think this is mostly a reach as nobody who doesn't study that world would catch these references. There's an argument that might say that Spike could only get these types of references in the movie by putting it on this group of buffoonish characters, but it's also just as arguable that he diminishes the value of those references by attaching them to buffoonery. So, you know, you decide that one. But all those references do foreshadow that it was the Mau Mau's that had the courage to take direct action to address the harm being done by Delacroix toward the end. But again, that's another thing for later. When the show starts, Delacroix is surprised that there's no real pushback to the overtly offensive things that he's putting on TV. In fact, it's getting rave reviews. Yo, I just got the news from the CNS brass that was at the tape, and yo, they love the pilot. Yo, we're a mid-season replacement. They ordered 12 shows. We're gonna be on the air in three weeks. But there must be some sort of mistake. The only mistake is I didn't believe in your genius from the get-go, from Jump Street. Dela, you are the man, bro. 
And for a moment, he seems to have a crisis of conscience. Is what he's doing still this elaborate prank? Is he making some grand statement about the nature of racism in the Hollywood business? Or is he just selling out simple and plain? For answers, he visits his father. And in his father, we find the legendary Paul Mooney. And Paul Mooney is basically playing himself. Paul Mooney is incredibly funny, but also crass and outlandish and really inappropriate for a modern era. White folks wanna be black folks. I went to school with white people. Their lips weren't that big. Huh? They get stuff in their lips, they take it out their behind, they just do anything to get big lips. A black people been killed on the highway and they come by, I'll take these. <laughs> <laughs> they all act black, sound black. I hope they start hanging again. I'm gonna find out who's black. <laughs> He was an edgy comedian well before his time, and his unwillingness to play the game and tone down his act is one of the reasons why he barely made any type of mainstream attention for all these years. He was far more successful as a writer for other comedians, propping up careers of guys like Red Fox, Richard Pryor, and even Dave Chappelle. I liked Mammy, though. I really, I thought she was great. I thought she had a great role. So Do you know in real life it was Hattie McDaniels? I they wouldn't let Mammy go to the opening. Uh, Hollywood, I, but, no, no, Hollywood goes too far. But she she's dead, adorable. but she's dead. But everybody comes well, back. Everybody comes back to get their money. She, she, uh, she came back as Oprah Winfrey to get her money. <laughs> his conversation with Delacroix typifies the value of his integrity, but also the cost. Mooney's character gets to live a life he finds fulfilling and uncompromising while doing what he loves with people he loves. But his struggle and poverty betrays the consequences of such integrity. Not only does he not have the resources befitting of his talent, He'll also never have the recognition. How did you end up here? I got too much pride, too much uh, dignity, integrity. I can't do that Hollywood stuff, man. I can't say that stuff they want me to say. At the end of their conversation, Delacroix knows that he doesn't want to end up with the same fate as his father. And from there, he decides to double down into the surprising success of his minstrelsy. Delacroix decides that he will do whatever it takes to continue getting a bite at this apple. Did I want to end up where he was? Hell, emphatically, no. Sloane, who is no innocent bystander, by the way, notices this. She is finally having misgivings about the whole thing, but she's not in charge, so she's just along for the ride. She gives Delacroix this minstrel piggy bank kind of as a signal as to what's really happening here. This bank is this exaggerated black minstrel figurine with his hand out asking for coins. And if you give him a coin, he does a little trick and he pops in his mouth and rolls his eyes backward as he eats the coin. And then he holds his hand out for more. I love these black collectibles. Really? How so? It reminds me of a time in our history in this country when we were considered inferior, subhuman, and we should never forget. Don't you try, Pierre? Yes, why don't I give it a whirl? Something, ain't it? Sloane's face here in this scene is clearly implying what she's trying to explain to Delacroix, but it's too late. At this point, the awards are coming, the endorsements are coming, he's making money, Mantan and Sleep and Eat are making money, he makes a spectacle at himself at an award ceremony, and consistently denies any harm that he's doing. People who at this point are sick and tired of the TV industry, and there are many in the community at this point who say what they're doing has got to stop now. What do you say about the fact that the line has to be drawn here? Those people need to wake up. I mean, sl up to slavery has been over 400 years ago. We need to stop thinking that way. Stop crying over the white man this, the white man that. This is the new millennium, and we must join it. There's so many warning sounds about the harm that's being done here, but nothing seems to work. Even a conversation with his mother isn't enough to snap him out of it. With love and through tears, his mother tells him point blank, a c is a c I thought you told me there would be no buffoonery. Are you going to attack me too? The show is a hit. Why can't you be happy for me? Of course I'm happy for you, honey. But a coon is a coon. What is a coon? 
So earlier in the film, De La Quar goes into this strategy meeting where another character, a white character, gives him a playbook of sorts that she called the Mantan Manifesto. This list is one of the reasons why this movie is still so relevant 20 years later. The goal of it was to give De La Quar enough tools and enough ways to spin and avoid criticism from the obvious awfulness that they were doing to make sure that if anybody ever came on the attack, he would know what to say. The Mantan Manifesto reads as follows. One. We gainfully employ African Americans in front of and behind the camera. Two. Let the audience decide. Three. Who put these critics in charge anyway, right? Right. Four. Who determines what is black? Yeah, what is black? Five. Mantan is a satire. Six. If they can't take a joke, you know what? F them. Yeah, F them. And seven. This show was created and conceived by you, right? a non-threatening African-American male. So the show can't be racist because you're black. This movie came out like six years before a certain very prolific black director, billionaire made their first movie. Not that I have anything else negative to say about this person, but it's almost like Spike predicted his arrival. Let me just, let me just say this about Spike or anybody else, or all the critics, anybody else, you know, it's only black people that do this to each other. I have never seen Jewish people complaining about Seinfeld. I've never seen Italian people complaining about The Sopranos. It's only us as Negroes that do this to each other. Who determines what is black? Have always been exactly as they are now. Their behavior and the ways that they defend and avoid accountability for the behavior has never changed. This is the same type of shit that Terry Crews said when people looked at him funny for numerous weird takes a few years back. You can hear the Man Time Manifesto and the rants of Kanye West and the arguments of Candace Owens or Charleston White. And I bet that dancing watermelon dude that called himself the grooving gorilla pulled a few of these talking points out as well. Have you ever <laughs> caught backlash from your name? Being yes, the all the time. Everybody's just like, you know, the history of it. But I'm like, look, you guys need to understand that like, it, like, you can't just make it about that. Like, I'm literally just, like, this is, I love gorillas, I love gorillas, and I, I dance. And you, if you guys are making it more than it is, it's just like, it, you don't, it doesn't have to be that, you know what I mean? Like, right. yes, like the, the history, the past of people calling us gorillas or monkeys, yes, I understand, but this is a new era. This is the future. Let's like, you know, move forward into a new generation and just like vibe and just put positive energy out there. Like, I just don't see it like, it has to be offensive. I'm calling myself that. I'm not, I'm not like trying to put it towards anyone else. I'm calling it because I embrace it. Like, you know, it's me. Yeah. So. Slavery has been over 400 years ago. We need to stop thinking that way. Stop crying over the white man this, the white man that. This is the new millennium and we must join it. And if you happen to be here to see if I'm going to say something about various figures who may have made some videos or tweets angry about me and my peers casting judgment on their behavior, if you go back and look at those, you'll see some of the same arguments. Notice, never actually explain or argue how what they did wasn't some shit. It's always, well, who made you king of the blacks FD signifier? Why do you think all black people should think alike? <laughs> is a racist slur. Is it? Is it? Or are you a <laughs> If you Google the history of the term <laughs> and click on literally the very first link and do no other research because you're lazy or not as smart as you and your fans think you are, you might get the idea that the term <laughs> only existed as a pejorative term used against black people by white people connected to these racist caricatures from minstrelsy. Or at least that's what the Jim Crow Museum might indicate to you. But if you actually know how to do real research and maybe go through the hard work to go to like literally the very next Google entry, you might find an article that leads you on a long journey into the history of this word. So the real origins of the word obviously start with raccoons, right? Like hopefully people get that, the, the sound effect is a raccoon sound. Anyway, raccoons were a readily accessible and cheap form of meat historically in the United States, but specifically for black slaves, it was maybe some of the best meat they can get because they were allowed to hunt and eat them freely on larger plantations. Over time, this caused raccoon meat to be stigmatized as being meat for poor black slaves. And at some point, this negative attachment manifests itself into a minstrel character named Zip first embodied by white minstrel actor George Washington Dixon in his song, Zip. Old Zip is a nerdy scholar. Old Zip 
He's a natty scholar. Holds it. He's a natty scholar. He plays upon the banjo. In the holler. From there, the character is definitely enshrined into minstrel history that you can find in the Jim Crow Museum. And his caricature is used as a derogatory term toward poor and enslaved black people by white people. That much is true. But from there, the word eventually takes on a new purpose, as many words tend to do historically, especially in black American culture. So the word have been irrevocably attached to these harmful stereotypical images of black people, images that black people were not responsible for creating, but suffer the consequences of. And once again, understand that menstrual actors were sometimes black and recall again, the story of Step and Fetch It. So these images that were very harmful and hurtful to black Americans that reinforced stereotypes that were often used to validate mistreatment of black people were also promoted and supported by black actors that were just being paid to play their part. Regardless of the intent, those black actors were still partially responsible for that. And they should have known better because while the white actors could take off their shoe polish makeup and re-enter the white world, the black actors could not remove their skin. They had to continue to live on as black people suffering from the very stereotypes they helped spread. And many often, despite nominal wealth, were required to remain living in black communities where they were probably somewhat ostracized. These communities did not turn a blind eye or forget how these individuals behaved and how their actions hurt other black people. Thus, within those communities, these menstrual actors are moreover black people that embody that menstrual aesthetic and ideology by trying to ingratiate themselves to white people at the expense of black people were often forced to carry the names of these characters. The Sambo, the Mammy, the Uncle Tom, and of course, the What I hope is clear here is that the way is used by black people in black spaces right now is not as a slur. C is a label. Well, um, what is his project to do? I, I'm not uh, too well writing on the situation. I don't know exactly what they're trying to do. You know? A white woman at the next table saying, look, there's OJ sitting with all those And I remember in my naive day, saying to OJ, gee, wow, that was terrible for you. He said, no, it was great. Don't you understand? She knew that I wasn't black. She saw me as OJ. And, and really, at that moment, um, I thought he was fucked along with Uncle Tom and all those other terms, has for longer than not been used to identify and sanction black people doing the bidding of white supremacy. There has never been a shortage of black people since slavery more than willing to sell out their blackness and do harm to other black people for the approval of white people, whether it be those who peddle harmful images for the entertainment of whites or exploiting other blacks for their own personal gain. This is nothing new. And it's also not new that these types of folks have always been met by ostracism and ridicule and criticism. And this is not like some practice unique by black people. Most any niche or oppressed group, whether it be women coming up with the term pick me, skaters and punks using the term poser, unionized workers coming up with the term scab, or black people coming up with the term c all marginalized groups seeking to create unity among themselves will create terms to ostracize those who refuse to get in line and fit in. Black people are not unique in this behavior. We just as usual get extra attention for it. Historian and author Brandon Stokey states the following in his book, In Defense of Uncle Tom, Why Blacks Must Police Race Loyalty. If large percentages of blacks reason that racial progress requires solidarity, impeders of that solidarity would naturally be ostracized. Again, social science literature supports this point. Psychologists report that low status groups clean deviants out of their own nest before contesting their subordination. Deviants are low status group members shunned for preventing improvement in the group status by blocking the in-group's attempt to bring about social change. Deviants violate group social norms and are consequently sanctioned. By ensuring that their ranks are deviant free, subordinate groups prepare for the intergroup conflict. Stokely draws a straight line from the depictions of blacks and minstrels to the prominent uses of the word today in common black parlance. The point of the label is to be a form of protection by way of social sanction, ridicule, and likely exclusion from predominantly black spaces, as well as a concerted support from black people. Stokely cites athletes, politicians, and entertainers who have lost favor of black people and suffer because of such labels. However, this book was actually specific to the term Uncle Tom, which is somewhat interchangeable with although I'd argue that is worse. 
course, but we're getting into semantics. Either way, Stokey still evokes the same argument around the use of the word. <laughs> Stokey presents a, I would say, even killed analysis of the word. And although there's a lot of stuff in it I don't agree with, he inarguably does two things. One, he effectively documents how these types of terms came into being and doesn't at all bother engaging with the idea that they act as slurs in any meaningful way. And two, he endorses the belief that the use of these words is an important tool that black people have to protect themselves and address their social political needs. Black folk have group interests an opposition to white supremacy, a desire to secure happiness in a world where anti-black racism dedicates itself to deny life's joys. Epithets such as instill intraracial discipline. They teach individual black folk that certain behaviors that damage the group's interests will not be tolerated and will incur penalties. Black folk who work on behalf of white supremacy deserve criticism, but that doesn't strip them of their blackness. Yes, being called a c tends to wound the spirit, but black folk must be allowed to protect themselves against members who sabotage the race's well-being. And I want to be clear, I didn't need to look up this fucking book. Like, <laughs> like this is for a select few motherfuckers watching this video. The very idea that I'm explaining to non-black people why the word c is not a slur and that if your friend, your black friend gets called a c it's probably not by accident. Motherfuckers aren't just being mean. We're making a fucking point. This is just as dumb as explaining why white people can't say the N word, but there's also white folks that don't get that. So of course there will be some that don't like what I'm saying here. So if you don't like what I'm saying, you can go read this book. The book actually, the book is as fair and like nice about the concept as you could ask for. You might even find a decent enough argument to defend your favorite streamer or video essayist or commentary YouTuber from being called a but you'll at least understand that the shit is not a slur. <laughs> anyway, Stokey presents a relatively compelling argument about the fact that maybe is used too frivolously to critique other black people. And he also provides what I think is a really useful definition to explain that when we're talking about a we're not just talking about a black person that doesn't do exactly what other black people do or is into things that are not traditionally attached to black culture. Stokey points out that being not politically inclined or not wanting to really engage with black politics is not something that should make someone a And believe it or not, that's something I actually believe. But what he does point out is that when you operate in the space of politics as a black person, your blackness can give you a lot of cachet around black issues. And the favorite trick of the is to use their blackness to shield their white friends and benefactors from accusations and telling criticisms of racism or discrimination. Thank you, Chairman, for the opportunity to testify. Um, I just I want to testify just as a, a black American today, and uh, I want to first start off by saying that white supremacy is indeed real, uh, but despite the media's obsessive coverage of it, it represents an isolated, uncoordinated, and fringe occurrence uh, within America. And in those cases, being labeled a cool identify why that's some bullshit and lets other black people know what type of person we're dealing with under the circumstance. And of course, that's when they come back with, we're not a monolith. Why do all black people have to think alike? They're not speaking to the fact that maybe Maybe they're just defending a racist. This is why the aforementioned Mantan Manifesto is such a profound thing. The Mantan Manifesto provides useful, though very shallow responses to all the criticisms that might face a <laughs> They'll complain that you're trying to take their blackness instead of engaging with why they're being called out. But when you just take away my black card and say that I'm not black anymore and you don't even want to discuss it with me, you just want to say that white people have brainwashed me, that's where I really have an issue. And it's bullshit because calling someone a doesn't mean they're not black. In fact, you can't be a if you're not black. The point is to address the harm that's being done and put a stop to it. And I don't begrudge the fact that some black people feel stifled and frustrated by this dynamic. It can feel draconian. But if you're doing active harm, people will respond accordingly. When say your white friend does some racist shit and you defend them, maybe even join in calling people niggeritas and then subsequently get called a for your behavior, it's not your blackness that's getting police, it's your anti-blackness that's getting police. But I get it. 
No one likes to be criticized. And Cohen is such a grievous insult that it stings, especially if it's true. Further, as you see with figures like Candace Owens, Charleston White, Thomas Sowell, Jesse Lee Peterson, etc., can be quite lucrative. And this is why Delacroix doesn't seem hurt by his mother's words. It doesn't change anything. Gillis? Yes. You disappoint me. Y yes, well, I have to go now the hell are you smiling at? And that begs another question, actually. Despite knowing of his father's disapproval and his mother's shame, as well as growing resistance and criticism publicly and privately, Delacroix continues on the minstrel show path and it's just doing numbers. It has a huge audience, a black and white audience. People start showing up to recordings of the show in blackface, writings it through the roof. Delacroix receives a reward for his work and in his own words, knowingly plays the grateful Negro, knowing that it will guarantee him work opportunities in the future. If I did that, I'd be assured of work forever. Delacroix, the grateful Negro. Delacroix doesn't say a lot in the latter half of the film. He kind of becomes a passenger in the movie's plot in a way that I don't think is accidental because it symbolizes how being co-opted and selling out isn't this instantaneous thing most of the time. I think when we imagine what it looks like to sell out, that there's this meeting that you go to when a bunch of old white men in suits come and like open up the golden suitcase and say, you know, do this sellout shit. But in reality, it's much slower. It's a compromise here, a decision not to speak up there, and suddenly you're you're rationalizing egregious behavior that you've never have thought possible previously. We see Delacroix's office becoming more and more inundated with images of minstrelsy. He starts hallucinating about the piggy bank as it reflects his own reality of holding his hand out for money and doing a little trick when he gets it. And it's no surprise that other cracks start to show in their whole program. The first person to defect is Womack, AKA sleep and eat, leaving after having had enough of the c as is typical of how black people of lower statuses are exploited by the black elite and petite bourgeois, Womack feels the brunt of what is happening. There is no cognitive dissonance, no Mantan manifesto, no awards to help him. He's the one that has to put on the black makeup and dance and sing. So he's also the first one to get fed up. Yes, yeah, so what you want me to do now, sir? Anything for you, sir. I sang for you. I tap dance for you, my sir. His departure creates a rift between Mantan, Sloan, and Delacroix. Mantan and Sloan had begun a romantic relationship and Sloan was trying to maybe sow a few seeds for things to eventually change. And in response to this, Delacroix reveals that he and Sloan had a relationship at a previous time to Mantan. This leads to Mantan also eventually defecting, but not before making a spectacle of himself at the final showing. This scene is really powerful and it starts with first this like long drawn out and gut-riching montage of all these people in the crowd, all in blackface, just doing the most stereotypical awful shit that they perceive of black people. Honeycut, a recurring character that plays basically the MC during the show, works the crowd asking everyone, are you a n Come on, move. You yes, sir, Bob. Don I'm a the crowd joyfully participates, illustrating this Fanonian Afro pessimistic concept that blackness isn't a distinction made of people, but a condition of being that is assigned to a person, or once they become black, a non person. But you know, shout out to Philosophy Noir to get more details on that. And after this is all over, Man Ray comes out without his makeup and without his costume and delivers a soliloquy that is similar to one he did in the film, except the earliest soliloquy is from the perspective of people perceiving the behavior of black people judgmentally. And then this version at the end is from the actual perspective of black people. I am sick and tired of being a and I am not gonna take it 
And it's meant to illustrate this point of the black struggle, regardless of what position you're in. When Mantan finishes his soliloquy, he starts dancing again, but it's not the showy, buffoonish tap dancing that he's done the entire time. It's a much more angry and like uncontrollable dance that Savion Glover, the actor that played Man Ray, is known for. And he refuses to stop doing it until he's eventually forced off stage by security. Get him out of the building! Hey, yo, get off! Stop dancing! Oh. In this quick moment, Dunwoody delivers a really powerful point that if you're not thinking about it and paying attention, you won't even notice regarding the nature of which is that you're on a really short rope and you're easily replaced. You're done. You see, niggas like you are a dime a dozen. You think you're special? I'm going to just slide Honeycutt right into your spot, you fake-ass tap dance kid. Get him out of the building. And if you in any way try to skirt the boundaries or step out of line, you will be replaced. After being thrown out of the building, Mantan doesn't make it far. He is very quickly kidnapped by the Mau Maus, and true to their namesake, the Mau Maus murder Mantan on national TV. After which they are then themselves killed by police officers. All except 116th Black played by MC Search, who is actually not 116th Black, or I don't know, he might be, I, I don't know. He's definitely Jewish, I'm not quite sure. But he offers this last parting shot speaking to the fact that he was not shot by the police, lamenting being denied his blackness by the only real authority that can decide who is and who isn't black, the police. You should have fucking killed me! All it takes is one fucking drop of black blood, motherfucker! Go black! Fuck Immediately after all of this, De La Croix is in his office drunk and mourning and inexplicably suddenly has a blackface mask of his own. Sloan comes to his office and confronts him with a gun for his role in the tragedy, which results in her shooting him. But in his final moments, he consoles her and sets to make the shooting look like a suicide before laying down to die. All of this is followed by a pretty long montage of menstrual images before we return to De La Croix one more time where he delivers a line to keep him laughing accompanied by a sweaty face man tan in full makeup for the camera. The end is dark and complex and delivers a few important points, but there's one thing about it that always bothered me. Why didn't the Mau Maus kill Dunwoody instead? Why did they kill Man Ray, who from all critical angles is the least empowered and least responsible person for all the harm being done by the show? There's clear explanations of this, of course. The Mau Maus pointed their ire at the most visible symbol of the and by killing him, they send maybe the most widely impactful message. They probably don't know who Dunwoody is, as most of us seldom actually know the man behind the curtain. Also, even though this movie was mostly independently made, I doubt Spike Lee could have gotten it fully finished if he depicted a brash group of black revolutionaries as capable of murdering a white character played by a Jewish man. So considering Spike's own brushes with accusations of anti-Semitism, that would have been a very bad decision. But still, this outcome frustrates me. A little while back in the middle of all this drama with certain black YouTubers, I made a video called The Fly in the Milk Experience, and it was a call-in show discussing what it means to be a fly in the milk, aka a black person, usually a young person, that has to grow up in an environment where they're surrounded by whiteness. It was just weird for me because I thought I would kind of find a place where I belong, but I did not belong because I was not raised like them. The, the culture was extremely different than what I thought I knew about black people, which was not that much. It's an experience that happens to a lot of black people, a lot of young black people are going through it right now, and it can leave them scarred in unique ways that are often not discussed because this experience isn't very much in the main umbrella of black experiences, so it doesn't quite get the attention. And the goal was to talk and unpack this experience to consider how to address it better. Because the educational system I was put into a different that's essentially. Because of that, I've been around a whiteness so much. I've been called one of the good ones, like, oh, you're so articulate, yada, yada, yada. So there's that pressure for white people. But honestly, it's done a lot of pressure for like black people too. You act white, you're an Oreo, you're a t type thing. Being called a t by the last people around who I was trying so desperately to fit in with, I was trying to like uh, be a part of, be a part of the community. It didn't make me feel any more black it made me feel like oh i'm black but i'm another type of black it was, it was an othering of 
my black experience. For some of these kids, it's genuinely between a rock and a hard place. The trite phrase, too black for the white kids and too white for the black kids. Now, of course, there's levels to this shit. Anti-blackness is real. And depending on how you might have been raised, you might have a lot more anti-black sentiment in you that you aren't even aware of until you say the wrong thing in a black space and get ostracized. Further, I'd argue that the experience of being a token, a fly in the milk, desensitizes you to the harm you experience daily. Meaning that you'll probably have a very different gauge of what harm has been done to you and what harm you might do to others. If you grew up around white kids that watched iDubs and PewDiePie, you might think that certain type of jokes are funny. For any of you who think me and my subscribers are a bunch of savages, just get a load at how perfectly the word is written in this letter. That's right, a savage couldn't write that well. But you say that shit around the wrong cousins, you might get called a from the perspective of a person going through that, I can see how this could feel incredibly cruel. Cause not only do they likely not know any better, they don't even know what they don't know. But at the same time, I don't blame other black folks on how to respond to perceived threats in this context. Are toxic on a variety of levels and we're hyper vigilant for a good reason. But that hypervigilance doesn't help address the actual problems. And in reality, it's almost this very Carlson mentality that we don't check in these cases. When I look sometimes at the way that black folks ostracize other black folks, black folks that maybe have been guilty of I can't help but think that the response is sometimes a little bit overboard and not recognize that an overboard response to that is also itself rooted in anti-blackness. Here's where Stokey, I think, provides a useful criticism that I don't fully agree with, but I think it's important to engage with. The third period of Uncle Tom's use, marked by destructive loyalty policing, must end. A fourth period must supplant it. One where supporting evidence always accompanies accusations of betrayal. The days when blacks are deemed sellouts merely for being conservative, for disagreeing with majority thought, or for otherwise being outside the mainstream, must cease. Some will contend that the preceding chapters, littered with persons wrongly pained by Uncle Tom wounds, demonstrate that blacks must put down the epithet as one would an uncontrollable beast. It is too wild and dangerous. Careful minds will aver. To advocate for jettisoning the imposition of interracial discipline, however, is to promote an idea that would never come to fruition, but harm the black community if it somehow did. Blacks benefit enormously when race members appreciate that to portray the race is to summon rhetorical punishment. But moving forward, blacks need to have confidence that racial loyalty enforcers will apply norms judiciously. And this is why I don't fully rock with the Mau Mau's here. I feel like their outrage at another black person transgressing so grievously, they made them lose track of what their real goals were. In a way, they fell for the bait. Not only was Mantan not in control of the whole show, he was by far the least empowered person of the equation. All he wanted to do was get off the streets. That show will probably be back on TV in a month or two, and all the Mau Mau's except for one are dead. And are a problem. But that problem isn't born out of the ether. It's a byproduct of certain black folks trying to survive white supremacy that maybe have weaker constitutions or no shame and will gladly if it means they can get ahead. It's important to address this type of behavior, if not just to keep it from spreading, but the bigger emphasis should always be on the structure that incentivizes Moreover, for those youth who don't even know that's what they're doing, if they're open to correction, they just need support and guidance. But I feel like the Carlson mentality thing in play here makes a lot of people far too eager to punish the behavior as opposed to doing the hard work to fix it. We need a, a restorative justice model toward that's 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 the that's the point of this video. By taking out Mantan, the Mau Mau's maybe made a significant political statement about being on cold. But had they put in the extra effort to attack someone with real power, that would have had a much more significant impact. Black political thoughts and movements have historically always gotten bogged down with petty and sometimes not so petty infighting, often by design with literal influence by the CIA. The movement by the FBI was very efficient, very simple, really. Um, I'd stolen a car and uh, went joyriding over the state limit. And um, they had a potential case against me, and I was looking for an opportunity to uh, work it off. And um, a couple of months later, that opportunity came when uh, uh, FBI agent Roy Mitchell asked me to uh, go down to the local office of the Black Panther Party and 
try to uh, gain membership. I just began to realize that the information that I supplied leading up to that moment had facilitated that raid. I knew that indirectly uh, I had contributed and I felt it and I felt bad about it. And I think that's something that Spike wanted to engage with because he himself is not perfect and has plenty of criticisms. But one thing I've always liked about Spike was that he was very honest about his positions. So I think the murder of Mantan and Delacroix's subsequent murder by Sloan typify a specific conflict that Spike himself was dealing with in his career as a director. A conflict that I find myself relating to more and more, although at a much smaller scale. But I also think Spike wanted it that way. Spike didn't want to end the story in a situation where the obvious bad guys, the obvious and people doing harm to black people got exactly what they deserved. Instead, he gave us a convoluted and kind of ugly ending that doesn't feel good when you watch it. I'd argue the underlying reason for that isn't so much about Spike Lee's views on and buffoonery and more about Spike Lee's plight of making art under white supremacy and capitalism. Spike wanted us as the viewer to feel a specific type of conflict that he himself was dealing with in his career. And it's a conflict that I see now because I find myself relating to it in this movie very differently than I did before it, although at a much smaller scale. So believe it or not, I have on more than a few occasions been called a for my content here on YouTube. Now, I don't take these accusations all that seriously. It's usually by black manosphere, black conservative types who don't like the fact that I'm insulting, you know, Candace Owens or Kevin Samuels or something. A lot of black neocons say that all my videos are is me nicely explaining racism to white liberals and like a little bit, a couple of videos early on. But, you know, if you watch my shit, you know, that's not really true. But even in it not being true, even in being very proud about some of the ideas and issues that I help promote on my platform, I can't shake the feeling of tokenization that inevitably comes with being black and successful in a given lane, as well as the way your views and ideas get way more credit than they maybe deserve when you have a platform. Making it so you become the black voice instead of one among several black voices. And I don't want to be the one black person that teaches racism to white people. I don't want to be like an item on your list that says, listen to marginalized voices. I don't want to be the bread tube equivalent of the wire, right? But in reality, every action I take, regardless of how subversive or radical I perceive it to be, even if I make a video called fuck the police or a video about the struggles of black boyhood, if I'm good at what I do, which I am, my audience will grow and people will respect my views and ideas and value them over others. And if I'm lucky, they'll leave a comment, a like, a super thanks, or even join the FD signifier Patreon. For just $1, you can join the FD signifier Patreon, but you only get my appreciation if you do that. For $3, you could have participated in the new FD Signifier movie club that met earlier in January where we talked about the film Bamboozled on a live stream as well as access to live premieres of this video and future videos. And for $10, you get a discount on merch, which I'm wearing right now, early access to exclusive content, including lives, podcast episodes, etc. Patreon is the only income that I can safely predict and thus it's the main source I use to invest in making better content and editors such as Neatless who edited this video on a super tight turnaround window, mind you. I'm Sean Parker. Oh, he's wired in. That's what I'm talking about. And by the time you're watching this, I'll be hopefully building out a full on home studio. And that is only possible with your support. So please, if you can sign up for the FD Signifier Patreon, links in the description. Was that by the way, that wasn't me lampshading my Patreon call to action. That was genuine. Join that shit. Give me more money, please. But the fact of the matter is having a large Patreon likely means that I'm depending on white dollars to keep it going. Does it make me a to beg for the resources I need to continue to do the thing I love? Does it make a difference if my content is watched by a predominantly black audience or serves a predominantly black agenda if it's still funded by white dollars? But also, even if it wasn't Patreon, my sponsor Nebula is partially owned by me, but mostly owned by white people. And let's not even get into the fact that I get an AdSense check from Google. Number seven on the Man's Hand Manifesto says, always remember this is made by a non-threatening black male. And in my ideal self, I'm this dangerous radical figure that scares white people. But that ain't reality. Niggas cuddly.
I, I can't fucking help it. I'm sorry. It is what it is. And sure, I probably have some more opportunities and more patrons if I were a little more moderate and a little less political, but you don't get to the level of success I have without being digestible to white appetites. What are my options here? What are any black artists options? Somebody tweeted a few weeks ago that Kendrick Lamar is a white people rapper. And that bothered the fuck out of me because I get why they said that, right? It's not at all possible for Kendrick to become who he is right now, Kendrick Lamar, the number one rapper in all of hip hop without a large adoring fan base. You saw the girl saying in his face in that one meme, but does that make to pimp a butterfly his best album and arguably the best rap album of the last two decades any less of a love letter to blackness? I don't know. What is the take there? And I think that's a question Spike is leaving in the air here because Spike Lee isn't just a black director. He's Spike Lee, the most prolific, successful, radical, outspoken and decorated black filmmaker of all time. And he's done nothing but make black movies of various permutations, but he's had to do them all with white money and has at times had to depend on white viewers who make his project successful because if he's too black or too experimental as with in bamboozled the film flops which bamboozled did so even as successful and skilled and respected as he is in a white supremacist capitalist society that means that spike has to stop in between every project and put his hand out for money maybe it's not a patreon call to action but it's built from the same parts and for what to still also be limited in what he can talk about, to still get half the budget of his less talented and less proven white peers. Do y'all know James Summerton had more patrons than me before he got out as a plagiarist? Are y'all fucking kidding me? James Summerton had more patrons than me? And you have to consider, like, if Spike wasn't there, what more radical, more dynamic, more progressive black art voices are we not getting because Spike is in the spot that he's in? I think he thinks about that. I think Spike understands that he just has a dream. He's just an artist and he's trying his best to get the resources he needs while not compromising more than what he's comfortable with so he can make his art. But he also is still processing and wants us as the viewer to process that this still comes at a price. And that's why I think the film ends with this montage of minstrel actors and figures with a really sentimental vibe. In watching the end of this movie and seeing all of the minstrelsy, it's not judgmental really. It's more bittersweet because you're supposed to remember that a lot of these people either didn't know any better or didn't have many other options. And at the end of the day still suffered because now they're permanently crystallized in time as these images that we get to watch step and fetch it a hundred years after he made his first couple of movies and still see him speak and move and talk this way. And that is its own form of suffering all for the sake of making art, which is why that montage ends with this long close up of Mantan for the camera. It's a reminder not to be too comfortable or proud on your status and maybe be more critical with how we engage with and regard figures like Mantan. Because in reality, we are all still shucking and jiving on some level to make it. We are all still putting on the new millennial minstrel show. Now, I think there's a huge difference between what Spike Lee does and what Tyler Perry does, what Kendrick Lamar does and what Drake does. And there's still a huge difference between the type of content that I'm making and the goals inherent in that content and some other black creators who just so happen to get called much, much, much more than I did. It forces us to ask, is your success a byproduct of you telling white audiences exactly what they want to hear, hiding from addressing and promoting black issues, assuring your white viewers that they're the good ones for listening to you, or are you trying to do the opposite? Are you making art that is challenging, taking risks with what you've built, and never forgetting the fact that you still operate in the same system as everyone else does? Are you debasing yourself for white validation? For you watching, and I know you are, you might think you're not debasing yourself, but are you sure? I'm just saying, if the only black folks on your side are also black folks that are never in community with other black folks, I don't know, we might have a point. But regardless of that, it's not lost on me that both I and Candace Owens 
collect checks from Google. So I need not get too comfortable in what my role in this equation is either. And neither should you. And when my video being white isn't real and here's why comes out, it is coming out. And that patron number drops, nobody should be surprised because to be shocked by the idea that certain white folks can't abide by certain black ideologies means that you've been bamboozled. You might have noticed that almost every time I said the word you heard a little raccoon noise over it. And that's because despite everything I've said in this video, YouTube feels that is a racial slur regardless of who says it. Mind you, I can say nigga all I want. I didn't block out any of the niggas in this video. YouTube seems to have enough sense in that regard. However, if I say the hard R, this video will get demonetized. And I don't like that because that means that YouTube doesn't understand the difference between me talking about what it feels like to be called a nigger versus PewDiePie just saying nigger because he thinks it's funny. But YouTube is a giant corporation owned by Google. It sadly does not surprise me. However, if you want to watch this video and not hear raccoon noises all through it, please check out today's sponsor, my streaming service, Nebula. YouTube is an amazing overall platform. I don't want that to be lost, but it has its limitations and flaws that are just fundamentally built into its design that are not going away anytime soon. This is just one of several ways that Nebula shows its value. On Nebula, I have much more freedom. I cannot care about my language. I cannot care about frivolous issues with copyright and demonetization. I don't have to worry about how a video will perform. So maybe that means that a video that's an hour and 45 minutes on YouTube will be 20 minutes longer on Nebula because although YouTube does like longer videos, I sometimes still feel pressured to shorten things a little bit for the main channel. But more than that, I don't worry about the algorithm on Nebula because we don't have one. We don't have a machine that decides for you what you might want to watch. The entirety of our site is at your fingertips and in your control. So you don't have to worry about how your watch habits are being tracked and modified by bots or AI. This means you can find your favorite YouTubers content without the ad breaks or ad reads like this or comment sections and like and dislike bars. Plus, you get access to tons of original work by these same creators that you can't find anywhere. At least 10 million of you may have gotten the joke I made about James Summerton and his Patreon because of H Bomber Guy's epic examination of plagiarism on YouTube. But maybe that four hour video wasn't enough. Maybe you want this nice 10 minute joint he does on HBO's True Detective. Maybe you want to see Lindsay Ellis's new video about the Beatles. Maybe you want to help support because I finally got the green light to start working on a project that I don't want to talk about too much, but I can at least give you a hint. But whatever might entice you, understand one thing. You are helping me and other creators be just a bit more independent of YouTube and a bit more free in what we make, knowing that we have the support of Nebula behind us, support that you give when you sign up using my promo code FD Signifier, which gives you 40% off of your subscription fees. Shout out to Nebula for supporting the video and thank you for watching. Peace.